Welcome to the rich history of Blowing Rock. Our host is Dr. Barry Buxton, who grew up here and shares his love for this beautiful village. Welcome to beautiful Main Street in the village of Blowing Rock. Growing up as a young person here, this was where it was all happening. We would all congregate here in Memorial Park with all kinds of activities. Across the street was the famous Story Soda Shop where we would all hang out. And uh, we had the theater, we had art galleries, we had so many things to do here. And you know, even today, I think it's fair to say there's something for everyone on Main Street in Bourne Rock. It is truly the heart and soul of our town. Is it any wonder that Southern Living Magazine named Blowing Rock a best mountain town and the nearby Blue Ridge Parkway a best scenic drive? Now that Blowing Rock has been featured on the cover of our state magazine with 13 full pages singing our praises, more people are sure to want to visit. Let's face it, Blowing Rock's Main Street is now on the must-see list for everyone visiting the high country. You know, there's something for everybody on Main Street. Children playing in Memorial Park, merchants engaging in trade, restaurants serving delicious food, art and history museums, places of worship, seasonal cottages, and of course the coming and going of residents and tourists. And let's not forget the beautiful flower gardens. You know, it's a place of charm, of course beauty, social engagement, and let's not forget the important history of Main Street. And of course, as we scroll forward to today, we have many special events like Art in the Park and Farmer's Market that attract people from not just Blowing Rock, but the surrounding community. But, you know, it hasn't always been this way. Before the turn of the century, Main Street Blowing Rock was unregulated, extremely primitive. It was a muddy dirt road flanked by wooden shacks, hog pens, cattle, horses, chickens everywhere, and of course the hordes of flies that are drawn to that kind of animal. Our first mayor, Uncle Joe Clark was quite a character. After having a few too many drinks, he actually stampeded a herd of cattle down Main Street. Thankfully, no one was injured, and after, after he sobered up, he called the mayor's court into session and convicted himself of drunk and disorderly conduct. He fined himself one dollar in court costs, and all was forgiven. The Great Fire of 1923 destroyed most of the structures on the east side of Main Street. This was really a blessing in disguise because it led to an era of modernization and a safer, cleaner, more beautiful Main Street. But you know, Main Street was also the site of one of the most divisive events in our town history. In 1924, over the strident opposition of many residents, a decision was made to widen Main Street. Fifty years earlier, beautiful maple trees had been planted on both sides of the road by town leader William Morris. These trees provided shade and beauty and contributed to the quaintness of Main Street. As you can imagine, in the autumn, Main Street was ablaze with color. Ultimately, the maple trees were sacrificed to meet the needs of the new king of the road, the automobile. But you know, through all the years, through the ups and downs, the great fire, the many changes that have evolved in our community, people of all walks of life still seem to flock to Main Street. And you know, I think they do it because the vibe is just so delightful.
Bullen Rock is often referred to as the crown of the Blue Ridge. Part of that is because of elevation. At over 3,500 feet, uh, we have spectacular vistas. To the west, we have the Johns River Gorge, Grandfather Mountain, Grandmother Mountain, the Limble Gorge Wilderness, Hawksbill, Table Rock. And to the east, where we are now, we're looking down on Blackberry Gorge. And uh, Blackberry Gorge has the Blue Ridge Parkway. We have Thunder Hill, uh, North Wilkesboro, Lenore, all below us. Uh, the Yakin River Valley is this expanse you see behind me now. And that extends all the way toward Winston-Salem. Before there was air conditioning, families came to Bowling Rock for the summer months to escape the heat and the disease of the lowlands. The cool, clean air provided invigoration and the majestic scenery was truly inspirational. You know, the Cherokee called Bowling Rock Cloudland and Walter Alexander, the great real estate developer, coined the term America's Switzerland. The forests surrounding Bowling Rock are some of the most diverse in the world native rhododendron, mountain laurel, and hemlock coves thrive. Black bears, bald eagles, and catamounts rule the forests. For the sportsmen, the crystal clear streams are home to speckled trout, and hiking and mountain bike trails are challenging and easily accessible. For the equestrian, the carriage trails of the Moses Cone Estate provide a journey back in time through native pine forests. The Donald Ross, Seth Rayner designed Blowing Rock Country Club golf course is among the most beautiful and challenging in the entire high country. With its uh, captivating location and the mild climate that comes with this kind of elevation, uh, we've attracted families of uh, the prominent business and industry leaders of America to Bowling Rock. Uh, I've mentioned before the Cones, the Cannons, the Broyhills, Stringfellows, Snyders, Prices. These are all names that are iconic in Bowling Rock, uh, our history, and how we have evolved. And you know, those families I just mentioned, they have been uh, so good to this community. They have been great uh, philanthropic families making donations to the hospital and many, many other causes. Because of its natural beauty, renowned artist Elliot Dangerfield established a summer arts colony in Bowling Rock. Dangerfield said, the scene of my greatest inspiration has been the mountains of North Carolina. Dangerfield's masterpiece Madonna of the Hills in St. Mary's of the Hills Episcopal Church is a must-see for all art lovers and also the devout. In the 1960s, because of the high elevation and mountain slopes, Bowling Rock became the home of artificial snow and southern skiing. This was due, in large part, to the visionary Bill Tallheimer an Alabama native who founded the Blowing Rock Ski Corporation. Southern skiing helped transform our town from a summer resort into a year-round tourist mecca. So here we are, high above the clouds, and I think you would agree with me, this is truly an inspirational place. Once you've experienced the beauty of Blowing Rock and its charm, it's always going to have a special place in your heart. Bullen Rock has always had a love affair with horses. They are such soulful creatures. Like Casino here, my dear buddy. They steal our hearts every time. As a matter of fact, the first equestrian competition was held 
on Green Hill Circle in 1897. In those early years, it was called the Tournament at Green Park, and it was largely a social event with area riders. The judges, who were all men, were alleged to be partial to pretty girls, regardless of their riding skills. So the prettiest girls generally rode home bedecked in blue ribbons. Horses and their riders would even parade down Main Street through the village, to the absolute delight of kids and adults also. The Bull Rock Charity Horse Show, which began in 1923 under the direction of founder Lloyd M. Tate, has grown steadily and now it attracts equestrians from throughout the Southeast and beyond. In 1928, the horse show was moved to its current beautiful location, the bucolic Broahill Equestrian Preserve in Mayview. You know, this is a place of true distinction because the Blowing Rock Charity Horse Show is the longest continuously running horse show in the entire United States. It has been honored as one of only 20 heritage horse shows in America. It was recently voted one of America's top 10 horse shows, and also as the newest addition to the National Show Hunter Hall of Fame. The peak of the summer social season has always been the horse show, with its parties and pageantry. Here. The glories of Bowling Rock before air conditioning can be recaptured. For many years, the Bowling Rock Fashion Show was held in connection with the Horse Show at the beautiful and exclusive Mayview Manor Hotel. This charity event attracted Bowling Rock's social elite and raised funds for many worthy causes, including the Bowling Rock Hospital. You know, this special relationship between horses and blowing rock, it dates back before the turn of the century. Today, the economic impact of the horse show is over $7 million annually in a small town like Blowing Rock. Competitors, owners, staff, they come, they rent accommodations, they eat in our community, and they spend a lot of money here. Good luck, by the way, going out to dinner during the horse show because reservations are impossible. Tourism has been an important part of the story of Blowing Rock since the turn of the century. Our first tourists were essentially campers. They came here, they built campfires, they pitched tents, they slept under the stars taking in this amazing view. They came here not only because of the cool climate, but also sometimes to escape the disease of the lowlands. The first tourists led to our first boarding houses and those boarding houses evolved into inns and of course later our two grand hotels and other hotels uh, but those first tourists were important in the evolution of Bowling Rock. Now I talk about those first tourists but organized tourism did not begin here until the 1930s and it began in this very place where I'm standing today. This is the Blowing Rock. This is a place of legend and lore, but it's also a place of spectacular beauty because it looks across at the Great Grandfather Mountain and Grandmother Mountain, Limbo Gorge Wilderness, Table Rock, Hawksbill. It all lies to the west. And this is such a beautiful spot. This is where organized tourism began, and it is from this very outcrop of stone that our town derives its name. And the man who started the Bowling Rock can be accurately called the father of tourism 
in Western North Carolina. His name was Grover C. Robbins. Grover Robbins served as Bowling Rock's mayor on three separate occasions, and he led the effort to recruit conventions and travel operators to Bowling Rock. He traveled widely and lobbied extensively for increased tourism and business growth. He founded the Blowing Rock Chamber of Commerce and encouraged a joint marketing effort between Blowing Rock and Boone to attract visitors. Grover Robbins' efforts firmly established the link between business growth and tourism, which continues to this very day in the minds of Blowing Rock's citizens. In 1933, President Franklin Roosevelt decided to support construction of the Blue Ridge Parkway. Grover Robbins lobbied hard for Blowing Rock to be part of the parkway route. He traveled to Washington, Raleigh, and Baltimore pleading his case. He recognized the potential for millions of tourists to come to Blowing Rock via the greatest scenic road in the world. You know, the old saying that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree was certainly the case with Grover Robbins Jr., son of Bowling Rock's patriarch of tourism. In 1955, Grover Jr. purchased Tweetsie, the former East Tennessee and Western North Carolina Railroad, and he purchased it from Cowboy Star Gene Autry, and then he began plans to relocate Tweetsie to a 400-acre site between Bowling Rock and Boone. North Carolina Governor Luther Hodges officially declared Tweetsie Homecoming Day, and thousands of people lined the tracks as the train traveled from Virginia to Hickory via Southern Railway flat cars. The cowboy television star Fred Kirby, who would later be so instrumental in promoting the train, was there to provide entertainment. Grover Jr. and his brothers Harry and Spencer expanded Tweetsie and also developed nearby Hound Deer's Resort and Beach Mountain Resort. Grover also built a frontier village at Tweetsie with a historically accurate train station. Over 70,000 people rode the train in 1958, and it was declared one of the outstanding attractions in the Southern Highlands. You know, today people from all walks of life come to ride and experience Tweetsie Railroad. The magic of this place, I mean, you cannot come here and not have fun and not have a good time. But uh, you know, when I think of Tweetsie, yes, it's part history, but it's also kind of part imagination. The serious side of it, though, is the economic impact. The economic impact is huge with over a quarter of a million people riding this train every year. And when people come to the mountains, of course, Tweetsie's right up at the top of the must-do experiences, you know, in, in our visitors. As a teenager, I worked here at Tweetsie. I put on bumper stickers on cars, you know, and worked on the chairlift, and eventually you evolve up to be a wild and crazy Indian on the warpath, and a cowboy too, how cool is that? Uh, you know, it's important to remember this place as part of the Robbins family legacy. Uh, the Robbins family has transformed Western North Carolina in such a major and significant way. It's hard to overstate their importance. Uh, I think it reminds us of our humble beginnings. Our humble beginnings as a poor mountain town uh, and now look at Blowing Rock today with our tourist experiences, our seasonal residents, uh, an all year season round Mecca for visitors, and it's uh, a magical place. And you know the railroad, the railroad that's such a part of this, the steel rails and the whistles that are long gone in our lives. But back in the day, 
This railroad was not just fun, it was not, not just an adventure, it was a way of transportation, a way of getting from East Tennessee to Western North Carolina and back. So it's not only a part of the Robbins legacy, but it's a part of our humble beginnings of Bowling Rock. And aren't we blessed today to have it still operating? Behind me is Flat Top Mountain. This was the summer home of Moses and Bertha Cohn. You know, I feel very connected to this place because I did the historic resource study back in the 1980s to nominate this very site for the National Register of Historic Places. It's very special in many ways, but it's most important because Moses Cohn was the single most important individual in the evolution of Bowling Rock and the history of our community. Just before the turn of the century, Moses acquired over 3,500 mountaintop acres to fulfill a boyhood dream, to construct and supervise an estate of his own design, an estate which would be a model of self-sufficiency and natural beauty. The estate included Flat Top Mountain, Rich Mountain, 500 acres of rolling farmland, and significant stretches of virgin hardwoods and evergreens. On this magnificent site, Moses Cohn, respectfully referred to as the Denim King of Blue Jean fame, constructed Flat Top Manor, a grand, majestic white Victorian neo-colonial home with 20 rooms on four floors, including Tiffany windows and many other distinctive features. Oxen were used to haul lumber some 20 winding mountainous miles from the railroad head at Lenore, and tenants living on the estate were hired to help with the project. The Cones were environmentalists before the term became fashionable, working to preserve and enrich their land. Three lakes were constructed with the advice of their close friend, Gifford Pinchot, governor of Pennsylvania and a noted conservationist. They planted extensive pine forests and hemlock hedges. White-tailed deer were imported from Pennsylvania and milk cows led to the first grade A dairy in Watauga County. Carriage trails were constructed under the guidance of Bertha Cone for the pleasure of horseback riding and carriage riding. Perhaps most important, the Cone Estate became a major force in the economic well-being of Blowing Rock. At one time, the estate employed over 30 families, many of whom lived on the estate. This was 20% of the entire Blowing Rock Township census population. No one did what Moses Cone did. He created the Cone Apple Orchards. Imagine over 10,000 trees and 30 varieties of apples. And he created that apple orchard as a benevolent attempt to provide an alternative economy for many of the families of Blowing Rock. He felt that subsistence farming was a very difficult life. I mean, you know the people that have been subsistence farmers and they eke out a living from the land. Moses Cone wanted something more for the people of Bowling Rock. So he employed most of the residents of this estate at the Cone Apple Orchards. As you might also imagine, Moses and Bertha entertained a wide variety of people from all walks of life here at the estate. Leaders of business, leaders of government, leaders of of the arts as well. But you know, entertaining all of those people, their special joy was in entertaining the children from the families who lived on the estate and the families from our community of Born Rock. And when they entertained, I know this from Bertha's notations, their favorite thing to do was hand-churned ice cream. And I also know that the favorite with all the children was 
the flavor of peach ice cream. The, today the Moses Cone Estate is part of the National Park System and it's a very important part of our history of Bull and Rock as well. It provides endless opportunities for hiking, for uh, horseback riding, and carriage riding, for fishing, and all of the beauty of the Blue Ridge Mountains you can take in and absorb. Located as it is at milepost 294 of the Blue Ridge Parkway, it's home to the Parkway Craft Center. Provides thousands uh, visitors every year with a glimpse inside the home of one of America's most important and philanthropic industry giants. He did so much for this community but also for everyone associated with Cone Mills and all of the people who work there. You know, to me, the commitment of caring that he had for the people of the mountains and his stewardship of this mountain land creates a legacy going forward, a legacy of Moses Cone that will always be remembered and appreciated. You know, the arrival of charlatan Walter Alexander in Bowen Rock in 1917 marked the beginning of a dynamic era. Before Alexander, there were two primary residential areas. One, of course, was the village that we all know and love. The other was Green Park to the east. Green Park at one time was its own separate community with its own post office. Walter Alexander believed there was only one way to do things, and that was first class. In 1920, Alexander published a beautifully illustrated promotional travel log featuring Mayview Park and Bowling Rock. This publication, which was entitled In Cloudland, rivaled anything produced in America at the time and was exceptional in capturing the feeling and the spirit of Mayview Park. His brilliant promotional strategies brought Bowling Rock to the attention of thousands of prominent families and contributed to the town's growing reputation as a seasonal mecca. Mayview Park was designed to be the finest resort in the Blue Ridge Mountains. The original tract of land was 600 acres of splendid virgin timber. Alexander personally supervised much of the road construction to protect large rock formations, towering chestnut trees, and panoramic overlooks. But you know, with, with the arrival of Alexander, in less than a decade, he would transform Blowing Rock forever, expanding it to the west and establishing Mayview Park. Mayview Park was intended to be the premier residential community in the southeast and all of the southern highlands and that's because alexander knew only one way to do things and that was absolutely first class he was a genius both in the development of property but also in his promotion he was a visionary who was an environmentalist before the name became popular his vision for this place was not only to beautify but to protect and that's evident today as I sit here on this stone wall that dates all the way back to the Alexander era. He built cottages here of chestnut bark which was a beautiful building material that is long since gone. Now if you travel around Bowling Rock you can still find some of those chestnut bark homes but they're few and far between. I was very blessed to grow up in one of those chestnut bark homes, just a stone's throw away from where I'm sitting today. It was above the antlers, and today you may know of that as the Bistro Roca Rust Run. It was a special place to live, a beautiful place to live. Resort recreational amenities included clay court tennis, golf at the Norwood Golf Course, trout fishing, hiking, horseback riding, hunting, and swimming. 
1923, Alexander founded the Mayview Gun and Rod Club, which had 100 charter members who each paid an initiation fee of $500. The club was managed by the world-famous sharpshooter and Wild West cowgirl, Annie Oakley. Of course, the crown stone was the splendid Mayview Manor Hotel, constructed to promote tourism on a grand scale. Alexander hoped to make Born Rock America's Switzerland. The main dining room of the hotel accommodated more than 200 guests and was the scene of many elegant dances. Alexander recruited large conventions to Mayview Manor Hotel, including the North Carolina Press Association and the North Carolina Bar Association. His goal was to bring movers and shakers in business, industry, government, and Hollywood to Bowling Rock. Through the 1950s, Mayview was more than just a hotel. It was a way of life. It stood for gracious living. White linen suits and straw hats, tennis dates and afternoon tea on the veranda, fresh flowers and white glove bellmen, horse show breakfasts and centerpieces of sculptured ice, ballroom dances and fashion shows, wicker chairs and stone fireplaces, old friends and balconies with a view. It was a grand era in the life of our town. Then, abruptly, the dream came to an end. Alexander's sudden and unexpected death at Hotel Charlotte in the fall of 1925 left the entire Blown Rock community shocked. By November, the Mayview Manor Company and all of its great plans were placed in the hands of receivers as a result of a lawsuit filed by the estate's creditors. It was also home to the rich and famous. They were drawn here because of Walter Alexander and his vision, but they were also drawn here because of the beauty of this place. It drew people like the Cannons, the Reynolds, and the Royals, many of whom still live here to this very day. Mayview Park was a glorious legacy to the Walter Alexander story and Mayview Park and Blowing Rock. You know, Blowing Rock is blessed with many beautiful estates. Oh gosh, dozens of them. But I don't think a single one is more beautiful and historically significant as where I'm standing today. This is Shatola. The word Shatola comes from our first inhabitants of this region, the Cherokee Indian. And it was part of their hunting ground back in the day. This is actually on the old Daniel Boone Trail, this property. The word Chitola means haven of rest, and you feel that when you are on this property. You feel like you can rest and relax. The original 100-acre tract of land was purchased by Lot Estes from the state of North Carolina for the incredible price of five cents an acre. The Estes family were early prominent citizens of Bowling Rock and were related through marriage to the Greens, Watauga County's first permanent settlers. Located on the legendary Daniel Boone Trail, the property included a horse stable and served as a way station for freight, passengers, and the mail coach. Later, a beautiful lake eventually to be called Silver Lake, and a four-bedroom family home were constructed on the property. After the Civil War, the home became Bowling Rock's second boarding house, and guest cottages were later added. A dam was constructed 
along with the area's only grist mill. Mountain folk would come from miles around to get the grist mill to have their corn ground into meal and their wheat into flour. Silver Lake was later stocked with mountain trout and fishing attracted such dignitaries as Governor Zeb Vance. In the winter, Silver Lake provided ice for the community. With no refrigeration, residents used ice houses to store their perishables. Back in 1892, the property was purchased by a very, very important influential, influential family that moved to Boulogne Rock from Anniston, Alabama. Their names were William and Susie Stringfellow. He was a successful banker. She was aristocratic from a wealthy family in Alabama. And when they moved here, they did many, many things to beautify this property. They named this place Chatola, and it stuck and it has been such a part of our community. Many people, when they come to Blowing Rock, this is what they first experience, Chatola, and they fall in love with it. And how can you not fall in love with it, with its beauty? Mr. Streamfellow loved the outdoors and had a strong interest in horticulture and landscape architecture. He imported a wide variety of trees and shrubs from throughout Europe. The, they entertained lavishly and added a spring house, smokehouse, servant's house, caretaker's home, and a large horse stable. They hosted many colorful parties with Japanese lanterns strung around the elaborate flower gardens. Susie Stringfellow was the earliest queen of Blowing Rock society. The Stringfellow's genuine interest in the welfare of the community was really a hallmark of their life together. They established the first Boy Scout troop, funded the construction of the new Episcopal Church, donated to the public library, organized the Blowing Rock School Betterment Association, the Blowing Rock Exchange, the Civic Improvement League, and the local branch of the Campfire Girls. You know, today, Chatola Resort and Spa remains one of Blowing Rock's most beautiful landmarks. It features a beautiful lodge, condominiums, freestanding homes. It features all sorts of outdoor activities, including fishing and uh, hiking, tennis, and the spa, of course, has an indoor swimming pool and all of the features you would expect in a modern-day spa. But I think importantly, this place continues the legacy of Blowing Rock because it is contiguous to the Cone Estate with all of the horse trails, all of the walking trails. You can literally, from this very place, Chatola, walk to the trails of the National Park Service uh, at the Moses Cone Estate, and you can walk for miles. Many people do who come here and they run and there is just so much good fishing. It's a place uh, of just great historic significance to the town of Bullen Rock. You know, Chatola, how can you not love this place? I mean, it is just so beautiful and it is a haven of rest. So we feel so blessed to have it part of our community and all of the people who've helped make it special. This is the fascinating saga of Greystone Towers. So many amazing twists and turns connected to this property. It's like a soap opera. Folks, you cannot make this kind of thing up. It is a, truly a story of Blowing Rock and some of the amazing people who lived here and built homes here. Greystone, inside these gates, Greystone Towers was built 
in the 1920s by Robert and Myra Mebbin. The Mebbins purchased 42 acres from Walter Alexander on Pinnacle Crest, Mayview Park's highest peak. After hiring an architect from Boston, they spent $250,000, a huge amount in those days, to build Myra's dream home, Greystone Towers. The German Gothic style castle provided much needed work for local builders, contractors, and engineers. And a winding gravel road beneath a labyrinth of trees led to the stone and chestnut bark structure. The beauty of the extensive grounds, a section of which was terraced with native stone walls and planted with colorful flowers, reflected Myra's desire to have a very special estate. Her impeccable taste was also on full display in the interior design of Greystone. Greystone's fortress front jutted and scowled off the cliff edge towards Grandfather Mountain, and the construction workers jokingly commented to one another, enough to wake old Grandpa, ain't it? And the story of the Mebbins is one of social elite. They were among Bowling Rock's most prominent couples in both the 1920s and the 1930s. They had money, they had prestige, they had good taste, power, and relationships in high places. They were the quintessential Bowling Rock power couple of that era. Remember, I mentioned that this is like a soap opera. Myra was originally engaged to Robert's son, Robert Jr. One time, Robert Jr. brought Myra home to meet his father. Well, sparks flew. Cupid was on hand. And when Robert Jr. traveled to Europe, leaving Myra here, Robert Sr. proposed to Myra, and they married. Robert, who was a native of Greensboro, was president of Republic Cotton Mills and later served as secretary of the United States Chamber of Commerce. Now, Myra was much younger, of course, than Robert, and, but she was attracted to him because of his influence, his power, and his wealth. Uh, Myra was also a multi-talented individual in her own right. She was one of America's foremost interior designers. She designed resorts for the rich and famous. And many of the families in America, you know the names, these were the Firestones and the Whitleys and the DuPonts. And I could go on and on with the number of people that she worked with. She was incredible in terms of her taste. But Myra was also a crack rifle woman trained by the famous Annie Oakley at the nearby Mayview Gun and Rod Club. She was among the first women to hunt big game in Alaska. This was the site of many, many opulent parties. And to support their lifestyle, the Mebbins employed two cooks, two housekeepers, two of the groundskeepers, and also a chauffeur. Robert played high-stakes poker in the third-floor turret room with well-known men of the era, including J.P. Duke and Governor Cameron Morrison. By the way, only men were allowed on the third floor because the gambling stakes were so high, a bank vault was installed on the floor beneath the turret. The turret had a stone fireplace and large picture windows, which offered a magnificent 360-degree view of Grandfather Mountain and the surrounding countryside. After Robert's death, Myra sold the estate to a Charlotte-based holding company. 
Thomas Shelton was the president of the holding company, and he actually lived in Greystone. To locals, Shelton was quite an eccentric. He kept to himself, and he liked to walk barefoot in the snow and ice. You know, the Mevins gave Bowen Rock and local people a vision of what the super-rich lifestyle was like. For example, Robert brought one of the very first automobiles to Bowling Rock. And not to be outdone, Myra bought the very first self-playing electric baby grand piano. She was also a showwoman. She had a beautiful show horse, a sorrel, five-gated, high-stepping horse that she would ride in events in the community. Theirs was very much an Epicurean lifestyle. Live for the moment. Live for pleasure. And they certainly lived for the good life. You know, it was a lifestyle that Blowing Rock had not seen before, nor has Blowing Rock seen since the Mevins. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the incredible story of Greystone Towers. Much of the history that Barry shared with us is from his award-winning book, A Village Tapestry. If you'd like to continue this journey of learning about the history of Blowing Rock, please consider purchasing this book. All of the proceeds from it are given to the Blowing Rock Historical Society. <laughs>